All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm going to take a, a page out of Oscar Boykin's playbook and uh, relax a little bit. So that's great. Um, I'm Stu Hood. Uh, you're at Twitter. This is a Scala Twitter talk. Um, I don't think I need to explain Twitter, uh, but a little bit about myself. I've been at Twitter since about uh, 2010. Uh, joined due to other open source projects um, and was already a little bit interested in Scala, but uh, Twitter's Scala open source efforts attracted me initially. Um, during this talk, please ask, answer, or ask any questions that you may have, because otherwise I'm, I'm terrified that it'll be very dry. So throw a hand up. Um, it's a history lesson, uh, but I think it's really interesting, or it was interesting for me at least, kind of going back and, and learning uh, or analyzing a little more deeply uh, the history of, of Scala at Twitter. Um, and these five themes, I, I'm, I apologize if anyone's colorblind. Uh, did not think to also do this in additional fonts. So theme one is kind of the history of Scala core and how it weaves into Twitter's history. Um, theme two in purple, red, Scala red. So you'll remember that probably. The rest you won't remember. Tooling, theme two, um, because we've kind of found that the history of Scala at Twitter is intimately related to the tooling that was building the Scala for you. Um, libraries, uh, because we would be nowhere without them. Um, are in yellow. Conventions, uh, because we don't yet have tooling that enforces absolutely everything we're thinking. So we have to have some conventions. Um, and then just general usage and how it's expanding within Twitter and, and elsewhere. Um, so first, just some very fuzzy numbers because comms, because comms team. Um, a few million lines of code, which is in the 5 to 10 range. Um, about 40% Scala and about 25% Java. Uh, there are many thousands of packages because we build small packa uh, yes. packages. Woo, all right. That wasn't the projector going off, so that's good. Um, we have many thousands of packages, uh, and we'll get into why that is. Um, we don't, while our open source efforts are project centric, we try to be more package centric internally. Um, and that's the thing that is in the, the distant future in terms of resolving. Um, Average of 10 files per package. I think that's low. I'm unsure. Uh, so in the very beginning, <clears throat> there was Scala 1 in January 2004. Don't have a screenshot, uh, sadly. But there wasn't really much going on with regard to Twitter at that point. Um, Twitter was not even, I think ODO was somewhere out there at that point in time. Uh, where things start to get interesting is around the Scala 2.0 era. Interesting coincidence. Twitter was founded, and Scala 2.0 were released in the same month, so interesting. Um, we began to have some alignment. But things really start to heat up around the Scala 2.7 era um, between 2009 and, and 2010. Uh, so by this time, um, Twitter had been building Ruby web services for a while. Um, they needed back-end web services. I don't even know if they bothered to build Ruby web services or whether they immediately knew that that was going to be brain dead. Um, <laughs> and so Scala 2.7 was the first uh, version to really take a hold at Twitter. Um, so Scala 2.7 was released. Uh, internally, we have a mailing list called Scala Cafe. This is a little late. Uh, to be frank, I don't. The history between 2009 and 2010 is a bit, a bit sketchy. Um, maybe, they were, maybe it's all in the tweets, and I just haven't looked at them closely enough from that era. Uh, but the first email of the Scala Cafe, you know, why isn't Stream lazy? The theme here is really just the collections are kind of awkward. Uh, but if you use 2.7 and into 2.8, you kind of knew that already, right? Um, you know, don't use an immutable hash map in a, in a highly concurrent uh, you know, domain because it's going to fall over on you. I didn't read all the way through, but it was probably something related to visibility of volatile fields or non-volatile fields, fields that should be volatile. Um, Easiest way to shuffle a list, list buffer, you know, all stuff that ended up in the standard library later, but primarily because the collections library um, was generic enough that you could put a shuffle method on random and have it actually apply to all the collections, which might not have been possible before. Um, so then we're immediately going to take a little seg into uh, a fairly significant talk that Alex Payne gave um, at. Twitter's first developer conference, Chirp. Um, 
And I'm going to bring up Brian to, to talk a little bit about that. But Alex Payne was the API lead for Twitter. And I believe the talk that Brian's going to um, transition to explains that. It's kind of hard to do a Scala talk um, following or going before Stu, because th this guy is a monster. And uh, uh, it's sort of intimidating. So I went out and I was looking. Well, we've talked a lot about Scala. Maybe I can go figure something out from one of the other talks. Maybe I crib some notes off him. And I found this talk, and it was, uh, I was like, oh, great. This is somebody who's already done the talk for me. I can just borrow from this one. And I started paging through it. And I, what? what? This doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, uh, and then I looked at the date, and it's five years old. Uh, and this is fascinating because uh, f five years ago, Alex Payne gets up in front of a developer conference and is pitching Scala to the whole world. And, um, and so I'm going to give you his talk, but a little bit, I'm going to, filled with commentary. So, uh, science. yeah, uh, informed by five years in the future. In five years in the future, you could look at this talk and see how ri ridiculous I was, and I'll, I'll deserve it. So uh, let's talk about this guy, Alex Payne. He, he, amazingly intelligent guy, like one of the architects of Twitter, um, was around way, way, way in the very early days, built some of the, the foundation of the company, um, went on to, to, to work on a bunch of different startups and, and, is, and now has a, like an advisory role at a bunch of places and does a lot of VC and just like huge luminary thought provider. Wrote the O'Reilly Scala book. Like I, I can only hope to be like half as smart as this guy. Um, and, and I'm serious, this guy's a, a monster. Um, and so here's his talk. He's giving this talk five years from now. Let's talk about Scala at Twitter. Um, so uh, Twitter was originally written in Ruby, and then the, the first sort of foray into Scala was on back-end services and said, hey, look, we can use Ruby for the front end uh, and use Scala for the back end. You used Thrift to intercommunicate um, between the two systems. Um, informed by, by uh, history, um, we don't want to use Ruby anywhere now. Uh, <laughs> partly because of the scalability problems, and we've grown a tremendous amount since then. And at, at first, Scala was great to, to put on the performant backend systems and have the flexibility on the front end. But now, then the front end was getting too much requests and too much load. And so even scaling the Ruby on the front end was a tr problem. And so uh, now our answer to this would be, well, let's just use Scala, or let's say the JVM everywhere. Um, we're a little bit more flexible with that uh, at Twitter these days, if you want to write it in Java. For certain applications, there's pragmatic uses for Java as well. So um, we, we do that as well. Uh, hey, nothing wrong with this one. Scala, it's a great language. You guys should try it. Um, OK, so why are we using Scala in 2010? Because the type system's great? Yeah, we like that. Flexible syntax. Um, yeah, except for if you want to like come up with standardization practices for formatting, it becomes a little bit interesting. Like, do you use dots on infix operators or not? And we've argued over that internally and just given up on it, I think. Um, traits, object oriented programming, yeah, those are all good. Um, here's my favorite XML literals. This is why you should use Scala. Um, Yeah, the rest is good. I, I, choosing between immutable and immutable, I don't know. I, you just use immutable as much as you can. Lazy values, overuse of lazy can get you into trouble too with the uh, race conditions between them. But oh well, I'm not going to be too critical about that stuff. Um, why are we doing concurrency in Scala in 2.10? We're using the actor concurrency. So this is funny because uh, we're not talking ACA right now. We're talking Scala actors. Um, pretty terrible. Um, I don't know, maybe there wasn't any options before then. This is pre-finagle, so there's no futures on here. Uh, it turns out, informed by history, most of the concurrency at Twitter is done with futures now. Um, very, very little. I mean, we don't really use actors at all. Yeah, I'll get into that a little bit. Yeah, and maybe, maybe offer broker, which uses some actor like the work kind of like Erlang thing has, has mostly faded into the background. Not, right. many, not too many languages are attempting to be like Erlang at this point. That's funny, though, because I got into Scala because I liked Erlang so much. But yeah, we can do better. We can do better than that. Um, Scala is the future. OK, so now I've convinced you all to use Scala. 
we're going to talk about how Twitter uses Scala in 2.10, and, and I'm going to be very critical about it, if you haven't noticed. Um, isolated components, yeah, we're doing that. Uh, we talk using Thrift, it says maybe Avro in the future. Hello from the future, we're not using Avro. <laughs> um, yeah, yep. Um, Thrift isn't great, but anytime you lose type safety by, you know, doing serialization, it's, you have to fight between, you know, compactness and, uh, and, and uh, expressiveness, so. And I would say that even Apache Thrift users are no longer using Thrift proper. So, I mean, Finagle, Finagle has its own implementation of what right. we call the top Thrift, and so Thrift, Thrift is great for making those struts, but then past that, we can't, we can't trust it. Thrift, the serialization format is good enough, right? The, the, the network protocol is, is, is ridiculous. It's not a network protocol. It's a socket you open, and you dump a Thrift across, and you read a Thrift back. So that's not a protocol. Um, yep, yep. I don't know what independently tested. Oh, well, yeah. So this is a big deal at Twitter, like, back then is like, oh, Twitter was a big mono, just a monolithic application. And so if you wanted to change one part in Twitter, you would roll out all of Twitter um, because you couldn't change individual pieces. And so this, this was like, oh, this is the pitch, is we can write just one part and just deploy that service instead of the whole website because we have, a, uh, we have microservices and, and, uh, you know, and have custom operational properties like different GCE. Uh, rule sets for different problems. Let me just say that sounds terrible. <laughs> I don't want custom operational properties. I want them all to work the same way. Well, no, but but for garbage collection, for example, search has a big search index that it holds in, in a very large old gen and you know that sort of thing. Versus something that's really quick, quick, quick. You want big eat in that. You know, I mean. Yeah, yeah. It flies in the same face of consistency. But yeah, if you can if you can get those tunables without changing anything else about the system. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, but this was a, this was a, this was a big deal back then because everything was monolithic. Um, so here's some of the services of five years ago. Kestrel for queuing. What do we want to say about Kestrel? Do we still use it? Uh, I'll say a bit in the presentation. Uh, it is still there somewhere. That's the thing about uh, systems that put things on disk. So right. Uh, so there. Flock and Gizzard is a sharding system, and then the Gizzard tried to be a sharding system independent of backend storage, and then Flock was the, that applied to MySQL. Um, it's incredibly performant. It turns out you can't separate sharding from backend storage. It's just not uh, two things you can separate, and so we've run into a lot of problems where it, it turns out if you're going to build a sharded data store, you have to build it completely, not separated between two libraries. Um, so while it was an ambitious uh, and cool idea at the time, it turns out that we've sort of not, not too great about it. Hawkman, I don't have never even heard of that thing, so we don't have that anymore. Uh, Hosebird's still alive. If you do the st streaming API, you will uh, use Hosebird. Um, here's some thrift. Uh, so. This is an interesting thing that we've actually gotten worse here. Not worse, but larger. So at Twitter, um, you know, we want to build reliable you know, components that we can share amongst people, and, and we try to open source as much as we possible. And then we try to keep the not invented here to a minimum. But we have very peculiar requirements. We had very peculiar requirements in 2010. The requirements we have today are ridiculous. Um, and. Uh, Sometimes people who want to use parts of the Twitter infrastructure get a little frustrated because we have, it, it all sort of wraps, you get pulled into the system. But uh, the thing is, is to, to build something to our scale, we keep running into these problems that we have to like, are forced to redesign systems that nobody else cares about. So, uh, but we have scalability problems that no one else is dealing with. And so it turns out that this has gotten bigger. Um, we're doing a very concerted effort to be outreaching to the open source community and get the little small ducklings to like use our, our, our uh, offerings as best we can. Um, but you have to realize like our peculiar requirements from 2010 are, are even worse now. Um, and some of the benefits... So like for example? Uh, what should we talk about? Yeah, I think Wiley would be a great example to talk yeah, about. I think, um, Finagle gets a little bit of flack for being kind of obscure in the sense that it's a lot of components that you can put together right. in various ways. And it's like, well, why doesn't it just work out of the box? Well, because 
maybe that's maybe that's the operational operational flexibility aspect. We would like all of our services to be deployed approximately the same way with Finagle, but it hasn't quite reached the point where you can say, this is the right way to deploy this service. Um, if you have more request throughput, you're gonna need to tune this down. If you have services that are up for a long time, you're gonna wanna tune this up. And so um, it's, more, it's more a set of building blocks. And even internally, the, the building blocks are put together in ways that don't look like a monolith. Here's an example, uh, load balancers in Finagle. So if you look at, uh, and everybody wants to compare Akka and Finagle, so I'll just do it. But if you look at load balancing in uh, Akka, I think that you can do random and you can do round robin. Uh, and there, I don't know if there's a load, something based on load, but in Finagle, we have the heat balancer, which looks at the load between all the clients and picks the one that's least loaded. Uh, it turns out that there are performance problems with that uh, as far as GC of being very large clusters of machine, your heap that you're balancing across gets large and then when it changes, like somebody re-rolls out the whole cluster, you have to GC that whole list of hosts and get another one. Only something you really worry about if you're dealing with huge lists of clusters. So then we went to a, uh, a different load balancer that did a, a weighted average based on time so that if certain things were up and down, up and down, up and down, we could average them out because if if they're up just briefly, then they have low load, then they'll get hammered by everybody. And so, no, we want to smooth it out. So we have this uh, weighted average algorithm that was culled from various research papers to get just perfect. And then that turned out that we needed something a bit more immediate. And then the clusters got even larger. So now we have a loaded weighted average balancer that only views particular parts of the cluster or take two which only compares two of them because statistically that's been shown in another research paper to work better. So that there's the, the, the choice load balancer, the EWMA load balancer, the heap load balancer, and there's one other one we're working on. These things provide huge, huge cost savings to us. If you've got a cluster that's just utterly massive, we'll save you a lot of money and you'll love Finagle. But this is a peculiar requirement that we're writing five load balancers when you're, you just probably just want one. The, the heap one we wrote originally works great. Um, but if you grow, then you'll, you'll, you'll just be blown away by how performant some of our stuff we've written is. So that's, that's kind of how that works. Um, ostrich. Uh, here's another thing. It's for doing stats. It, it turns out we, uh, Ostrich has some problems and we're trying to get away from it now. Um, the thing that Ostrich has is that it snapshots all your stats every minute. Uh, so on the minute boundary, it, it locks collects all your stats and then stores them for the, uh, for consistently for the next minute. That way you get even measurements even if you collect them uh, in, in a little bit different times. Uh, but because you stop, snapshot all the st stats and hold them around, you have a huge GC problems. You're holding all of these stats for a full minute. So they're absolutely gonna get promoted. And then right when you collect them, it drops them and then they go away. So uh, the GC properties of ostrich are utterly pathological. And you can't change this because it's kind of the API of Ostrich is it'll hold your last minutes of stats. And so we had to rewrite it. So we have a new library called Metrics that we've rewritten. Um, but we're actually exploring other stats uh, systems. Uh, we've taken the Finagle stats receiver and actually pushed it into Util so you can use it separately because it turns out people are just using Finagle for stats and not really uh, a self-contained. Oh yeah, there's a question back there. Um, excuse me, how do you We just scrape them from a JSON, uh, JSON HTTP web endpoint. You must have like a UI or like a dashboard. Yeah, yeah. So we have a collector that goes and hits all the endpoints and collects all the JSON and then stores in this gigantic database of statistics. And then we have a tool called Viz that just graphs them all on, on the web page. It is, it is, we would like to release it, but it, it's so glued into our infrastructure. It's, it's one of those things that like maybe someday we could. We wrote a great blog post about it though, where we describe all its behavior. Uh, if you look at the Twitter engineering blog, you can see a very detailed description of how it works. Yeah, the question was about the infrastructure. And I think not only is that not hosted on Cassandra now, it's hosted on Manhattan, which we've had blog posts about. You kind of end up with this tree of dependencies um, that you'd have to open source before, or genericize, spend, spend X amount of time genericizing before you want to open source them. So yeah. It's not that the will isn't there, it's, it's just some of the stuff becomes a lot of work to, to, to cut them out. I would say one of, our, one of our goals is definitely to make things easier to open source in general. And um, 
I believe that that's something that I can talk a little bit about near the end of mine. Uh, don't use ostrich. <laughs> Configgy. So at least, no, you shouldn't use config either. Um, <laughs> configuration is really, really challenging. The problem you have here is I have this application that I've written, and I want to configure di different properties of it. Because when I run it on my laptop, it's going to behave differently uh, than if I run it in the dev system versus if I run it production, right? In production, I connect to the production clusters, and maybe I want some stub data if I run it locally. And so you make this configuration file. But the problem with configuration files, like configies, is they're not type safe. And so now, how do you prove correctness of your configuration? It becomes difficult. Um, so when they originally wrote configy, it was pretty cool, but then realized that type safety is important. Um, it, as it is in our code, it also is in configuration. So then the next generation was util eval. Um, which was just bring along the whole Scala compiler and your configuration file is a Scala file that we just eval at, uh, at runtime. Um, so now you're type safe, but you just get runtime errors in your configuration. Um, and that's not great either because if you can compile your configuration, you can start pushing program logic into configuration. What you really want, the correct system, is going to have the utmost, the, the smallest amount of data in configuration as possible, and all of it is in your actual code. And that way, it's much, much more testable, and you just have very, very, very tiny flags that you switch between a, a finite set of options. And so our, our philosophy now is just that, is just command line flags, uh, and, and try to boil it down to the to the, the essence of your application and just pass in flags when you launch it. Yeah, and those command line flags come in via um, util app, which is provided by a Twitter server, which are both open source, as is metrics. Right. So well, I'd also like to point out, we, we still are the biggest fans of the developers of these libraries. Some, they're amazingly good developers, but it's a, there's context that we have now oh. that allows us to say this kind of yeah, Roby Pointer wrote Configgy. That guy's my hero. Uh, and he wrote an amazing blog post like two years later explaining why it was incorrect. And it's really, really awesome to read the, the original. And, but Configgy actually was, uh, type safe config is based largely on Configgy. So it's not like these ideas are, are poo pooed in the in industry. It's just, uh, it, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just a little bit tough in, in if you want to be utterly consistent. Um, Oh, question. Yeah. Is that sort of using Docker? Uh, no. 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 <laughs> as far as I know, um, but there is probably somebody in the room who could answer the question better. Here's Configgy. Uh, it's not type safe. Uh, specs. We use Scala test now. Although, you know, testing frameworks are set much more backseat into uh, how you write your tests. Um, I mean, if you wrote them all in Scala check, then you would be a superhero, but, you, but most of us are just aren't, aren't that ambitious. Um, we wrote our own Scala JSON parser, which was unfortunate because so did everybody else. <laughs> Yeah, we have the Twitter Scala JSON. But there was an official, an official one, too. Oh, no like there was one. It was more like an example. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work really well, so we had to rewrite it. And then now there's like 500. No, that's not Jackson. Yeah, we, <laughs> Jackson. Jackson. Um, it, yeah. But I mean, the problem with JSON is there's no standardization. And so no, no, no. Um, OK, other things we don't use. Uh, Nagati has been replaced by Finagle. I've never heard of Smile. Querulous is a, uh, is a MySQL client, but it wasn't based on Finagle, and so it doesn't use futures, and so it's single-threaded. Uh, so that can be a problem. Um, I've never heard of Jackhammer, but we do have a load testing framework that we've released that's called Parrot. Um, and there's other things we've, we've rewritten. Iago. Iago. Oh, it's called Parrot in the open source world. Yeah, we renamed it to, to confuse everybody. Querulous, uh, I think, is not entirely replaced by Finagle MySQL, but that is, it's maybe a 50 or 50 percent deprecation. Yeah, you should use Finagle MySQL if you, if you get into like really, really heavy MySQL hammering. Um, the problem with all these things is like they're all really good libraries, 
And, and back to our sort of like unique requirements, is like a very, very small flaw in a library will make it unusable when you bombard it with a ton of traffic. And so it's, it's one of those things that they might be even slightly more usable. Like Configi, for example, is extremely easy to get started with, which is sort of enticing. But uh, we get stuck here because like you, it has to not have bugs. And so you need the type safety. And then you get this whole complexity of like trying to boil down your configuration, which is harder to do. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I don't know what that is, but great. Oh, by the way, let's talk about build tools. SBT 0.7 isn't wonderful. Uh, this, I didn't like SBT 0.7 when it was out. Um, yeah. It was unfortunate. The, the thing is with SBT, though, is it's gotten much better lately. So even though we've been driven to, to roll our own, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of modern SBT. But uh, man, it must have been rough. You were around. What, how was that? Yeah, I'll talk a little bit. OK, yeah. Specs is it's fine. Uh, <laughs> IDEs were bad then. They're still kind of, well, um, we, we still use IntelliJ. It's gotten much, much better. Actually, the IDs are great now. Um, yeah, it does work with SBT. Yeah. So uh, just in closing, um, I think this is, is a really interesting, the, the overall theme of looking at this talk is like how much things change in our industry. Like even in the Scala community, you've decided to use Scala, and you're going to use all the latest, coolest stuff, and you've got the hippest guy presenting and telling you what you should do, and it's all changed five years later. Not that they're wrong, it's just you outgrow it or things, different things come out that are better. And, uh, and it's kind of terrifying like, like to, to look at this because I can't hope to be as talented as this guy and the people who originally built this stuff. And, and just everything gets blown away by the future progression of the technology. So uh, I don't know, I just found that interesting. Um, yeah, thanks if you have any questions. Yeah, I think, yeah, absolutely. And, and Mesos, um, I think, is a huge part of that right now. Again, keyword, maybe in five years, will that be the right answer? I don't know. But I do think that um, part of what I was talking with Alexei about before coming up here was that uh, what we need to figure out is now we can run processes anywhere. What is the standard API for processes to communicate? Um, what is the, for locating one another, service discovery, it, it's probably, it's the oldest story in the book, but it's being rediscovered in the new context of the, the data center operating system. Um, so watch that video, because I'm probably not going to talk about it during this talk. We're res uh, yeah, I probably won't, I probably won't get into that too much uh, about, any more about the data center operating system but I'll try to be interesting. OK, so we're resuming. Um, that was April of 2010. Still on 2.7. Um, creation of com Twitter util. Um, in terms of long-lived libraries and widely used libraries, com Twitter util is probably the most widely used library at Twitter. Um, and I kind of have injected uh, percentages of Twitter code that are using just future. Um, I would say that something approaching 100% of Twitter code is using util in some way or another. Um, but as util launched, uh, there was the introduction of future and try, but not the Scala concurrent future and try, um, com Twitter util future and try, August 2010. Um, and this was the symbolic birth of Finagle. Finagle didn't really, I don't think, I apologize, I don't have, but I'm sure it's a matter of public record when Finagle was initially open sourced. But this was the symbolic of, uh, birth of Finagle in that Finagle is 100% all in on the idea of future and promise-based concurrency. Um, never even touched actors as, as a potential uh, model. The other thing that was introduced with util is Scala's configuration, which is kind of the next evolution after configi was let's just evolve the whole thing. It's much easier to write. It's, much, it's type safe. The issue then becomes, as Brian said, you can put other stuff in your config. Evaling your config might have side effects. Um, it might work in some languages, but it does not quite yet work in Scala, right? Without, without potentially firing the nukes, as it were. OK. Uh, 
ooh, let's, let's go back to colors. I, I had half forgotten about the colors. Yellow is libraries, and green is convention. So we had libraries to do uh, config as actual config files and config as um, code. And so at this point, Scala as configuration was, was booming, um, unfortunately. Uh, and inevitably, uh, it took people a few months in production before they realized, I should compile my config. I should, I should have a unit test that compiles my config so that it doesn't blow up at runtime. And everyone rewrites that, anyway. Um, purple is tooling. Um, and so this is about where we've, we've reached this critical mass of, of uh, Scala libraries at Twitter. Um, they're all, they all have interdependencies. Finagle and Util are very careful not to have other dependencies, but if you write a useful library and you try not to rewrite uh, existing code, you're gonna end up with dependencies. And the thing about it is you, you want to encourage dependencies if you can, um, in the sense that you should not write something in the wrong place if you can avoid it. Um, and so if you're trying to avoid some dependency, you might end up writing something in the wrong place or rewriting it. Um, so we want to avoid that, but at the same time. Um, so fairly early on, we were figuring out we need some other solution. Uh, an approach to composing source trees with SBT. Anytime you see a quote like this, it's, it's essentially verbatim from internal mailing lists, like let's figure this out. Um, and this was a proposed solution to doing this. Uh, standard, Twitter standard project and inline dependency plugins were plugins for SVT um, that allowed you to compile things from source, your dependencies from source, if you were next to them. Um, and the from source part solves the, oh, is it close to me or is it far away? I'm kind of just tempted to rewrite it because it's too far away. Um, so, it, but what it would also do is it would try to add version checks. So I have the source. It has a binary, it has a version, um, but I'd really just want to edit it and I really don't want to try and publish it in between. So let's try to make sure that when I edit the source and then build and then later on publish and then depend on the artifact that I published, um, things are kind of okay, sort of. But what that trends toward is uh, I do a release for every Git SHA because if I don't, um, I have kind of this sparse history thing. And I'll come back to that. Um, more tooling stuff, still in 2010-ish. Uh, so there's lots of back and forth because this stuff hasn't rolled out fully. Um, you have breaking API changes in libraries, um, and people do their best. They're sending out email, you know, I bumped, I bumped the major version, or I forgot to bump the major version. Even if you don't forget, you end up with diamonds, right? Diamonds where um, I'm depending on you, you're depending on something, I, something else I use at a different version. Now I need to go figure out how to publish that other thing, right? Publishing is the bane, it's a theme. Um, we definitely had a few SPT and compiler bugs in 2007. Uh, I would say compared to everything we were dealing with internally, actual Scala bugs probably were never a huge issue. Um, but you definitely did see some copy pasta uh, between core libraries even um, that just weren't weren't inlined appropriately and between configure and ostrich as, as an example. I shouldn't have called that out here because it was, it was happening everywhere. So um, it's a little bit too difficult to make a change over there and then publish it, so I'll just edit it here. I'll just inline it the bad way. Any questions? Okay, we're still in 2010, I believe. Uh, on the theme of libraries, yellow. Um, there was a fair amount of internal early usage of actors, and you see in, in Alex's deck that we were recommending actors. Um, they kind of eventually all died out in terms of usage of com Twitter util future, and it happened fairly early even. I, I, there's a bullet point coming up. Um, my opinion on actors is just that the same way you don't want most of your devs using threads, you definitely don't want them using actors. Um, if you need to use threads, it's because you have this private state and you don't want private state anyway, right? So the vast majority of our mid-tier code is written to use futures, um, and there's almost no usage of actors internally. Uh, so op it, it, again, opinion, um, but it's what, it's what has triumphed, at least within Twitter. So I'm gonna make a seg uh, into talking about monorepos, because they go to that source, source dependency point. Um, I, put, I put the most controversial stuff on the slide with the smallest text. 
so we'll get through that fairly quickly. Um, but the idea behind a monorepo is that you build everything from source, or you have the source nearby. There is no near-far question. It's all near. You know, I can build, I can touch anything uh, within Twitter's code base fairly easily, um, and it, so it eliminates binary dependencies or inconsistent between, inconsistencies between the source and binary dependencies um, from your mind. Uh, additionally, it, mean, it lets you change multiple projects atomically in one commit. So if I'm changing both Finagle and Util, which was the very first place that Twitter was using these together, right? These are, these are definitely independent libraries. You shouldn't use both of them together, or excuse me, you shouldn't be forced to use Finagle if you're using Util. Um, but at the same time, they're so intimately, tightly related that not being able to change them together at once would be insane. I have to commit over here, and then I have to attempt to commit over here, but using the right published version from over here, and worked for a little while, but really probably in this time frame, like six months. Um, so you get, you can also kind of shorten or remove deprecation cycles, because if I commit to both of them, I don't have to release either of them. Um, and so this, this like, Oh, anyway. So top to bottom, continuous cross-project integration. So the idea is if you're building everything from source, you can build everything. Um, you don't need automation to go and bump the version manually and check whether it still builds. Um, and in general, you avoid publishing. So if I am fixing a bug six, six libraries away, I don't need to publish six times to get back to where I am. Um, and Git bisect is great. So we like being able to do that across the entire history. Um, and so obviously this, is, this disagrees with how most open source is done, and we're still trying to reconcile that. Um, but we think it's really important to reconcile that because we absolutely believe in open source. So stay tuned. Any questions about monorepos? Okay. So then, Scala 2.8, 2011 and 2012. Um, anyone using 2.8? Uh, no, not quite. Uh, no responses to that thread. Scala 2.8.1 is released. All right, we did finally upgrade. Uh, it was very hot to hawk. We were still in this phase where projects were living all over the place. They were in their own GitHub repos. It was difficult to, I need a thing. Where do I find the thing? Well, I'll search GitHub for the code that like the person sitting next to me wrote so that I can figure out where to get it. Then I figure out what you know, is weird about their SPT config so that I can actually publish them. Um, so various upgrade branches for each of the projects lived for a while. Relevant stuff was, was published, and then you had to go figure out what was published because you didn't, you know, you can't just say, I want the latest of a particular version because you've got diamonds to deal with. Were you ever dual publishing? Uh, Cross-publishing. The question was about cross-publishing, yes. Um, and I'm gonna get into that. Cross-publishing is kind of great, but it still doesn't tell you um, precisely which version to depend on, right? Um, yeah, so cross-publishing is a thing that we, we have missed, to be sure. Um, so there was a stronger push to get projects on 2.8, uh, and it mostly happened, mostly happened. We can't say that it happened at a particular time because these disparate projects, there was a long tail of things upgrading. Um, but we do know that 2.7 bugs were still biting people way into the summer of 20, or the spring of 2011. Um, so yeah, I mean, tooling-wise, there were diamonds, diamonds in the core libraries. Um, is there a standard version of Scala? Uh, not really. But at some point in that, in that summer, it was finally upgraded. We did experience some minor incompatibilities, but again, the theme you'll notice is that we had all kinds of other shit to deal with. It was not really Scala's fault, per se. Um, so the birdcage, I'm sure it's been talked about somewhere, but the birdcage was Twitter's first Scala monorepo. Um, first commits in March of 2011, and kind of a wider uh, announcement in April 2011, there were 12 projects in the birdcage. So it's a, it's a monorepo containing the source for Finagle, Util, various other things that are just kind of critical, the very corest of core libraries. Um, and that's, Com Twitter Future was, ut was imported at that point, and that's when I began tracking history. I didn't, I didn't spelunk farther back. Um, but at that point, Com Twitter Util Future was used in 26% of Scala files, which is something like 500 files, so not terribly impressive, um, in March. Um, so then the first major 
I say third party um, only in the sense that it was not in this source repo. Kestrel um, was initially an actors-based library. It migrated to futures. Uh, it went fairly well. They found a few bugs in futures, but in general, the code got much cleaner. Um, Roby, who we love, uh, switched to Comic Sans on the mailing list. I don't know if it's because like futures just drove them crazy, or actors had, or who knows what, but in any case, um, we love him. Uh, 2011, 2012. So we open source Scala School, um, and that was because we had a lot of new hires at that point. Uh, not because the Ruby and Scala worlds had really begun to mix. We'll get into that later. Um, additionally, you know, and this is kind of a theme that you'll see forever is uh, somebody's asking, like, I need something like type classes. And somebody recommends view bounds. And nobody really pushes back. Oh, no. Now we know. Um, in any case, the, the debate about OO versus functional continues. Um, but I think, as I've said here, uh, it's mostly resolved by having good conventions. Um, I have got lots of great models. I've got tons of anecdotes in terms of code that's running and has run for quite a bit of time. Um, but again, it's really not clear. Uh, there are a lot of things that are uh, idiomatic in certain contexts as OO or as functional. And I think the more fundamental thing in terms of just a like, dividing line, stake in the sand, is whether you're immutable or not. Um, being immutable rules out certain OO patterns just entirely. Um, the builder pattern is one that's still huge because it allows for immutability, um, which we love. So, but in some cases, you know, modeling things as classes is still the way. Back on tooling, what was green? Huh. <laughs> Convention, yes, thank you. Okay, so now we're back on tooling. Um, in 2011, 2012, uh, the first suggestion of, using, of switching to pants so this is weird. Where did pants even come from? How are we suggesting switching to it? Um, the issue uh, that has plagued Twitter for a very long time is that we wanted mono repos. We wanted to be able to not have a near and far in terms of code. Um, but the fact of the matter was that we had a repo that was, to be frank, uh, exactly modeled after Google's repo internally. Um, and it was entirely Java code with, a small, with the exception of a small amount of Scala. Um, and I, I apologize for not including when that Scala landed there. In any case, Pants had been born in this repo that was building the majority Java code and a little bit of Scala code. Um, and over in this mono repo, the birdcage, uh, there was the very first suggestion of maybe switching to Pants from SPT. Unfortunately, Pants wasn't quite mature enough yet, and so the actual work doesn't start until January 2012, but then I'll get to that. Pants build is open source, um, and I'll talk a little bit about it at, at the end, but it is now, we are now all in on Pants as our build tool. Um, so in 2011, tail, call, tail calls began being eliminated uh, in future allowing for kind of infinite, re infinitely recursive flat maps, um, which is fairly handy, being able to loop. How long uh, did it take Scala feature to copy the feature? I don't know. It was like last couple yeah. months ago. Yeah. Um, it's good. Well, and, and there's, there's a relevant data point in here, which is, um, that, well, the question was, how long, is it, how long before that was in uh, Scala concurrent future? There's a relevant data point in here, which I'll get to in a second. Um, this is also around the same time uh, that Scalding was first advertised internally. Um, first commit was in May 2011, uh, thanks to Avi Bryant. Um, and Oscar Boykin has a great talk about that, so that's there. But it was open source in January 2012. I will get to more on Scalding later. Now we're in the 2.9 era. So, Here's that point I was talking about. Uh, SIP 14 is the um, Scala Futures and Promises uh, SIP. And Marius commented on it, and he recommended against tail call, implement, or, uh, tail call elimination because it, it really does complicate things. Um, at the same time, the expectation you get on the other side is, I want to be able to write a loop, and I don't want it to blow out my stack. Um, 
my, my, my time, time disconnected stack, async stack. Um, so he had some great comments on that. Uh, I think the opinion was then and is still now that once everyone gets their things in order and APIs settle on both sides, it's a thing we totally desire to do, to, to merge. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. But at that point, it was just advice for, for the Scala developers on, on the development of this new API. Um, Effective Scala was open sourced, still a great, great resource. Hasn't changed at all, I don't think. It's still, still a great resource. I think just by, by virtue of focusing on precisely what we were certain of. Um, there's plenty of stuff that's not in there because we weren't certain about it. Uh, now in 2012, Maven. That came out of nowhere. So we were using SPT, um, but we were using SPT with internal plugins that meant that we were building from source. But it turns out that this is the thing that Maven has supported forever. Um, I don't know all of the details of why, but I do know that for a long time there, uh, it rolled out relatively easily. People got tooling fairly quickly. It disconnected us. It forked us from the community in the sense that we were now not doing what everyone else was doing. But it was a short-term gain. Um, meanwhile, also in the birdcage about tooling, there was some friction about squashing and uh, squashing history within Git in order to keep things consistent. So we're now committing all of our code, approximately, to this one repo, which has this consistent view of history of all the code. Um, and in order for that not to contain fix me, fix me again, to do, and all kinds of stuff like drunk in the last commit before, you know, uh, before shipping, you, you squash commits, you end up with a consistent history. Um, but this idea of getting everyone consistent was, was super, super out of Twitter's uh, wheelhouse. It was not something we'd done before. You, we had open source repos, they all had their own conventions. Um, there wasn't really any consistency, so the idea that consistency might be more important than, um, I don't know, opinion uh, was, was difficult to swallow. In any case, Scala 2.9 was released, and I think that's what probably pushed us over the cusp. We got excited about Scala 2.9, um, and we still had um, few enough core Scala developers that we got everyone in a room. Um, and unfortunately, because it had <laughs> occurred shortly after the switch from SPT, slightly short-sighted, uh, there was no cross-publishing, and so you did major version bumps. Like, I'm going to do a major version bump, release the library, continue to release on, on uh, the previous major version, um, and then that, that major version is the next, next version of the library. There's a reason cross-publishing exists, and you probably shouldn't do that. Um, in any case, it was very organic and kind of bottom-up, due, again, due to these repos not all being uh, within the birdcage. Um, also during this time frame, there were, uh, we contributed a bunch of time to improving Maven and Scala support in IntelliJ. And it's now very good. Two, you know, two, two to three years later, people complain that we want to take it away from them. So I don't know. It's, maybe it's just uh, Stockholm Syndrome, but it's un, we're unsure. OK. Again, this is on the, uh, the usage theme. So in 2012 and 2014, still on 2.9, there was a huge onboarding of Twitter devs to Scala um, because if, for, who's not familiar with the monorail? What, what a monorail might be. Okay, well, I'll talk briefly, very briefly about it. The monorail was the monolithic uh, Ruby application that was powering the, the, the front end of Twitter, um, but also a lot of API endpoints. Um, so this was a, a, a finally a top-down effort to, find, to say um, we are not going to write anything else there. It's time to go all in on Scala. Um, and before this, it was mostly limited to services, but now it was additionally many front end and API developers. Um, people were building custom web frameworks. We have now ended up with one. Yes, what's going on? We still use Ruby in places where scalability isn't a concern. True statement. That the statement was um, we still use Ruby in places where scalability isn't a concern. Like internal apps. Yes, correct. Yeah. And Ruby and Python are kind of going at it internally for internal apps at the moment. 
Um, so there were a ton of aggressive internal courses. It resulted in tons of questions to the internal mailing list. Like, this isn't like, you know, this is a little bit too different from Ruby. I'm confused. Um, big uptick, uptick in activity on the lists. Uh, but it all settles down. People, people seem to figure Scala out. Um, some more library stuff. Bijection was open sourced in 2013. And it caused a bit of friction because mathematical terms was fairly quickly resolved um, and is now terribly useful, so use it. Um, Scala 2.9, again, 2.9.3 we switched to internally. We were already on 2.9.2. Um, and then uh, April 2013, we deprecated get and apply um, across the entire monorepo of Scala code. Um, in, a, in kind of an, in an atomic commit. Uh, and this was via a compiler plugin, which I need to go and research a little bit more because we're finally, we're, we're, we're back in positions where we need to be using that again. Um, but the, the goal of this was to begin to align with Scala concurrent future. It's, it's glacial, glacial movement, but kind of for necessary reasons. Like we need, we need APIs to be in alignment or else we'll waste our time on this. Um, but by this time, uh, com Twitter util future was imported in 30% of Scala files. That doesn't seem like a huge improvement, except that by this time, there were tens to 20 thousands of Scala files. And so the fact that it maintained its, its uh, usage as the company continued to grow is really relevant. Um, also in this time frame, Stitch was created. Uh, who, who's familiar with Stitch? Wow, okay. So, Wow. Um, Stitch is a library for composing data requests. Uh, is Stitch open source? Stitch is open source, yes. The question is, yes. Not, um, not quite yet, actually. Very, very simple. Oh, that's why. Yes. That explains that. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, soon, soon. It's a great well, library. It's been, um, it's been promised over yes. and over and over. Yeah, yeah. Still yeah. We are, we are actually. Yeah, Travis says we're very close this time. So Stitch will be open sourced. That's good because I think it's amazing. Um, I think it's critical to a, a service-oriented architecture that things can mostly just act as if um, you have a single database. And Stitch allows for that by allowing you to compose queries um, in a way that you usually can't. So highly recommended. Um, created, OK. Yeah, I didn't say open source. That explains that. Very relevant. So then, now we're in the current slice of time, uh, 2014 through who knows when. Um, so the 210 upgrade was initially blocked on being 100% on pants. Wait a second, back on pants? Yeah, so as pants matured internally, living in this other repo, it was finally good enough to kill Maven. Um, and Pants has, has tons of merits. It's, it was designed from the ground up to be uh, a build tool for building from source, whereas Maven is always assuming that you have jars and is not necessarily trying to optimize across library boundaries. Um, so Pants was, was blocking the upgrade for a short period. Scala 2.10.4 was released. A common theme you'll see is that the, the last stable release of Scala was is released, and then we upgrade. Um, I don't think that was intentional, but somehow that's how it ended up working out. This is also when Summingbird was open sourced, another great analytics library um, that's absolutely open source. I know that. Uh, OK, so rumblings around, about around Scala 2.10, Amplify, upgrade actually starts in earnest. Because we're in a mono repo by this point, the Scala upgrade across um, two to three million Scala files is accomplished by two or three people. 80, excuse me, 90% of the upgrade is accomplished by two or three people, right? And then you have some number of failing tests. You ask people to come in and fix their tests, and then you commit it, and that's approximately what happened. Um, so Brian had a huge hand in that, and he didn't mention that, um, but it's huge. And I think it's really relevant to Twitter because it was kind of the birth of a framework for how you do these huge org crossing projects. You got a question? So yeah, in my organization, that would be like an incredibly scary thing mm -hmm. um, because of our test coverage. Are you confident in opting your test coverage that, that like, if the test passes, it works? 
Not necessarily, but you have to separate the difference between upgrading the Scala library and rolling out the service. Um, and so we separated it by, as long as we got all the tests passed and got it committed in source, then you as a service owner, now you get to go test and have fun with that. Yeah, the, qu the question was like, how, how do you actually test when, you, when you're landing it all atomically? And the answer is, you live in a branch for a while, right? The thing about having a monorepo like this is that you can actually use Git and branches to the fullest. So here is, here is the 2.9 universe, here is the 2.10 universe, and it's literally everything. It's everything that compiles with 2.10. Um, and so if you want to validate your service, and we asked people to you know, deploy out of this branch, and it gets, it's drastically easier than the idea of you know, finding all of the right 2.10 versions, updating your updating your, your uh, dependency file, um, having them conflict, doing it again, right, until you finally converge. So essentially, we have the, the framework now is if you want to make this massive cross-org change, you just create a branch, and then you invite people to work in it. Um, but, but also, it's important to distinguish the, the difference between committing it into source and rolling out that, th that code. And if we didn't roll out all of Twitter on 2.10 in one day, go, right. oh, I hope it works. You know, we wrote it up piecemeal over, over months. Yeah. But as long as the whole system builds and runs all the tests, then your little component will build. And then it's maybe there are bugs, but they're not ones that you exercise. You know, so your thing works correctly, and that's all that matters. As long as your testing is good. And, and actually, we do have really good test coverage. We actually didn't have any runtime uh, issues after the upgrade that I'm aware of. No, yeah, no incidents at all. Um, you know, Ellen DeGeneres takes a picture and we get an incident, but this upgrade didn't, didn't uh, do anything, which was amazing. And there was a couple of bugs in here that were really scary. Map ordering changed. Um, some people, uh, in 2.9, I think map ordering, if you iterated it, was sequential based on insertion, and then in 2.10 it was random. And so if you trusted that map ordering on iteration was the same as when you inserted it, you're gonna get in big trouble with that. Nobody ever depended on that, luckily. Yeah, I think one, one thing that's critical there too, and I, I totally forgot to put it on the monorepo slide, um, we call the monorail a monolith, we call a monorepo a monolith, but the, the fundamental uh, game-changing difference is that you don't deploy it monolithically. It's deployed independently on a team schedule when, it's cer when they're certain that they are going to be there to babysit it. Um, it's not, you know, an, ar an army of people on call for everyone else's stuff when you monolithically deploy. So you monolithically build. You guarantee it all builds together. But deploy-wise, uh, it's on your schedule. Um, we've just guaranteed that in the meantime, your code hasn't rotted. Um, and, and just to, to, uh, to talk more about that, also, we do stage deploys. And as we're talking about Ostrich and metrics, we have just a ton of metrics. So when you do a deploy, you have this huge, huge cluster, and you pick a few couple machines on it, and you roll your code out, and you look at the metrics as the graph is being generated, and then you see if anything drops, then you go, oh, revert, 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 and if it doesn't, then you keep going, and so um, we do these very careful deploys to ensure that maybe if it does have a problem, you're only gonna affect, you know, a tenth of 1% of the users gonna see it, and if they do see it, they go, huh, that's new. and they re reload, they get to a different server and it works again. So the problems aren't consistent, and so it doesn't actually cause any interrupt interruption of service. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Any other questions? Sorry. Any other questions? OK. That explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK. So by this time, we're in 2014. Actually, we're midway into 2014. Um, Com Twitter Util future has kind of peaked out. It's in a third, literally a third of Twitter's code, um, which means that a third of Twitter's code is explicitly async. Um, some of it is library code that is uh, math code, for example. It's not going to need to uh, ever represent itself as a future. It's going to be run synchronously on a thread in some number of microseconds, and so we're not concerned. Um, after this, after this 33% peak, I think Stitch actually begins to cannibalize a little bit of futures usage internally, and it, it's currently at something like 2%. 2% of code is using Stitch, and 32% is using futures. Um, they are partners. They're not, there's no, no chance that Stitch is going to take all usage of future. Anyway, um, Scalding at this point, which we talked about 
uh, about a year and a half ago in terms of this timeline, is now the default for all analytics jobs. For a long time, we had pig usage, usage of uh, Apache pig and contributors to Apache pig. All the contributors are totally on board with not doing that anymore. Um, and scalding has become the default. Um, so I don't know what the percentage of usage is, but it's, uh, there are no new pig jobs being written. So that's, that's very significant. Um, and Scala 2.11.5 is released. This has not immediately led to our Scala 2.11 upgrade. Why is that? So continuing story. Um, we now have this framework in place where we feel comfortable or we're, we're very close to feeling comfortable with doing these massive upgrades. I think Brian, Brian and, and Ian Connell, uh, O'Connell, excuse me, Ian O'Connell's work on the 2.10 upgrade was a huge um, kind of uh, milestone in the sense that it sets a, sets a framework for, for future upgrades. Um, the next one will be very easy. What will be the thing that pushes us over the edge? Uh, who knows, but it, it's probably not nearly as far away or nearly as nebulous as the, the previous upgrades have been. It is worth noting that um, lots of our open source libraries are already available for 2.11, and yeah. they are being used in production outside of Twitter. Yeah, so Travis was saying that a lot of our open source libraries are already cross-compiled. Thank you, SPT, um, for 2.11. And yeah, so use them. One of the things that's sort of delaying me is I think we can get such good tooling to do these upgrades that they can be nearly automatic. Yeah. And so doing a manual upgrade for a month, even two people, seems wasteful to me instead of spending two people spending a month writing better tooling that'll just go upgrade it all and fix all the bugs. And, like refactoring code, for example. Mm -hmm. I think we're really close to getting stuff to work like that. Correct. So that I'm holding back because I think we can write these tools that'll just make it super easy. Yeah, yeah. So we, we expect future, future updates to be drastically different um, than the past ones have. So uh, now I'm gonna, just gonna talk about kind of the continuing story. This, is, this used to be titled low-hanging fruit. They're not all low-hanging, but they're things we desire. Um, so in the Scala core, we just we always have a desire for less object overhead. You you want to be able to use the idiomatic library or API, excuse me, the idiomatic API because Scala does a pretty good job of creating idiomatic APIs that are fairly straightforward. Um, but in cases where they have zero cost, oh man, it's just it's a no brainer. Um, so we want more zero cost idiomatic APIs if possible. Um, we'd love improved support for maintaining consistent code bases because we now have many millions of lines that we need to keep consistent. Um, and we think Abide is potentially a great way to do that. Um, so we're on board. Uh, libraries, we're not using the async macro despite having future in 33% of our code, um, which is kind of nuts. Uh, that's at least partially because of the 210 thing. Um, but I think there's also a little bit of a boiled frog effect. People haven't noticed that uh, that would probably make some things clearer. Um, so we'll see. That will probably get a little bit of usage soon. Um, this one's kind of more personal. I, I, I and other people who write uh, APIs that deal with data or records um, really want Scala to be able to do something like shapeless, shapeless's hlist. Um, if you could just drop that feature out and put it in the standard library, it'd be amazing. Um, but we have relatively little usage of Scala Z and Shapeless and the other uh, highly functional libraries within Twitter, um, at least partially because we've discouraged them in favor of just kind of well-documented, more verbose uh, abstractions. Um, but HLIS is killer, and so I'd love to see that. Um, usage. Uh, Scala.js is kind of mind-blowing, and uh, we have a lot of JavaScript in, in that gap of 40% Scala and 25% Java. There's a, there's a fair amount of JavaScript. Um, it would be great to start using that, but I can't make any promises. Um, also, our code is, is Java with, with regard to Android, um, so we should, should definitely be using Scala there as well as much as possible. Um, tooling we'd like to see. So, Pants has a distributed build cache, which means that when you're building from source, it's not like you're building from source, really. Um, for this SHA and these sources, uh, fetch me the artifact. I don't need to publish it manually. It's just automatic, um, which is kind of lovely. Uh, 
but that's a thing that my team, uh, the DevPred team, um, is working on improving within Pants so that it's just ubiquitous. You don't even notice it's being cached. Um, everything's cached and should allow for some great, great runtime performance improvements. Um, as it stands, if you do need to test absolutely all of the, those many millions of lines of code, it still only takes like 30 minutes. So we're doing a decent job, but we could be doing much better. Um, and as Brian mentioned, or as we kind of indicated when we did that refactor from future.get slash apply to await, um, we really need large scale refactoring tools. We have everything in one place um, and we control what tooling we're using. So this, this last bullet point is actually kind of a, an invitation to the community. We're, we're ready for things to change in the sense that, you know, if we don't get an automated refactoring tool, we could use SED and, and get it done and make sure it passes the tests and then commit it. So that, you know, that's not too bad. Um, we'd love to see imp continued improvements, simplifications, uh, and expansions to the, to the library, or excuse me, to the standard library and to Scala itself. Um, and that's not, I think it's very important just to point out that that's not a place we were when everything was disparate and living uh, all over the place. So it's new. Um, thank you a huge amount to all of the kind of early Scala adopters. These are all Twitter, former Twitter employees who I love. Um, sorry, they're not all former, whoa, excuse me. There are some amazing, yeah, current em Twitter employees in here as well, um, who I won't call out. Uh, many, many great contributions from everyone. Um, who has questions? Yeah, so the question was about performance from the JVM itself and speeding up kind of sequential code when you need to. Um, we, we have a ridiculously good uh, JVM team, many of the former Oracle uh, GC folks, and they're doing a great job of bringing in new features and, and uh, maintaining very, very careful patches atop the JVM. Um, so I would say that we will, we're, we're positioned to take advantage of, of everything that's coming down the pipe and, and probably to optimize some things on our own. Um, that, that example was really just like, if you're doing numerical computation, which is fairly rare, like the idea of computing Fibonacci and then returning it via finagle futures, eh, you're not gonna do that very often. But if you are, you can put it in a thread pool, or excuse me, future pool, um, or execution context. Uh, limits you until you get like that, like the, where the real performance of the problem, like everybody else is doing large distributed systems. Like if you open that up and people can access your cloud pool to give you performance resources, I can do a web browser for JavaScript for, for a Twitter boost So like it, yeah. would, it would make your performance better and faster. Yeah. Uh, so I guess, I guess, I'm sorry, what you were getting at was open sourcing JDK related stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think uh, Tra Travis could speak more to that. I don't know if um, there's anything like that in the pipeline, but I don't see why not, so. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. What's going on? Ah, uh, yeah, so the question was, are we using Apache Spark? Do you know? No. No. Uh, there's definitely been experimentation. I don't think it's in production anywhere. Um, I mentioned scalding as having taken a huge pr uh, proportion of our of our jobs. Um, there has been experimentation about running scalding on Spark. Um, so it's more it's it, it's not an API that people again kind of like you know do people use Hadoop? They at at some point they stop realizing they're using Hadoop because they're using a library that's like ten layers above. And so I think that's probably what will happen. Um, I don't know who's going to be using Spark directly at Twitter. It'll, it'll be, most likely it'll be just like all of a sudden, okay, yeah, we decided, and then now everyone's using Spark without knowing it. Okay, I think we have time for one more question before Adrian's talk. Um, Who is the best one? <laughs> Put your hand highest. Who was first? Okay, uh, who was first? Anyone know? I'm sorry. Yeah. 
Uh, one question. Uh, during the uh, talk, you mentioned different build system. Uh, Maven, SBT, PAN. Uh, finally, what uh, Twitter build system looks like? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the question was about what Twitter's build system looks like. I love that question. Thank you. So I currently work on Pants. Um, uh, Pants is open source. Um, it was initially developed in that repo to build Java code. It sprouted support for Scala code. It kind of always supported Python. So it builds Java, Scala, and Python. Um, it focuses on packages, not projects. So the idea is if you have a Scala package or a Java package, that's you want it to be fairly small. You want it to declare its dependencies, and you want to require that it actually declares its dependencies, so that you don't have kind of hidden cycles in your build graph. Um, so the focus is on really small, reusable uh, packages, rather than even projects. Um, so it's written in Python. It's open source, pantsbuild.github.io, I believe. Um, and it's de developed in collaboration with Foursquare and Square and some folks. I. I'm not going to mention too many names, because, but I definitely know we're working with them all the time. Um, and that's worked out great in terms of open source in the sense that uh, it was a rough, a rough birth, but we are now at this point where it's kind of it's a tripod of equal contributions from, from those companies. So I highly recommend usage of pants. We, we do also um, provide SBT builds for all of our open source solid projects, and we use those SBT builds to publish um, the, the open source files. Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask a follow up on Pants. Uh, so, first of all, thanks to and Ryan for a fantastic uh, history arc. And I actually have this kind of peculiar interest in Pants because I asked <laughs> several times. Uh, you know, I heard about it from <coughs> Marius first when he was advising. Uh, my startup, and uh, I was really curious, right? Because in the world of uh, SBT and Maven choices, like Sil and Haribda, right? Uh, can you do something else? So Spence was actually found in the open source, but nobody wanted to talk about it. And I actually tried to get uh, Twitter folks and Foursquare folks to talk about it, and they wouldn't talk about it. And uh, I wonder, uh, like, what is the kind of idea of Pants right now? Is it is it ready for big time? Does Twitter wants it to go big time? Right. Uh, can it become a real big alternative to SBT? What What do you guys think? Right. So the question was essentially, do we want do we want more developers of Pants or use excuse me consumers of Pants right now? The the answer is it's it's definitely still pre 1.0. We know precisely what we need to do to make it 1.0. Um, but at the same time, it is it is the build system at uh, at three very large organizations. So um, it currently needs developers, not users, is what I would say. Um, but they're welcome. Thank you very much.